Happy Sabbath. How are you all? I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful week. Tonight, I pray that the Lord will continue to bless you with his presence, to love you, to protect you, and to guide you. And we're going to continue to study this book called Christ's Object Lesson. That means Christ using these parables to teach us something, some spiritual truth. And tonight the title is called Saying and Doing. Let's see what lesson he has for us. And this parable is recorded in Matthew 21, verse 28 to 31. Let me read. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. The boy answered, I will not. But later he had a change of heart and went. The father went to the other son and said the same thing. This boy answered, I will, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? They said, the first. Well, this parable is easy enough to understand. One obey, one didn't obey. But Christ actually has some deeper spiritual truth in this. Let's look at another verse in Matthew. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Again, Jesus said in another place, If you understand these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So it seems like Jesus wants us to be doers and not just sayers. Talk is cheap. You have often heard of that, right? For example, it is easy for me to talk about helping the poor than to actually sacrifice my time and resources to help the poor. And there's a saying that we shouldn't just talk the talk, but should walk the walk, right? You've heard of that. That's how we know whether when we say something that is sincere from our, or genuine from our heart by watching the actions. Concerning the parable, there are a few points the author wants to point out. The first one is actually she gave the context or the backdrop under what circumstance that Christ spoke the parable. Well, this parable was spoken at Christ's last visit to Jerusalem before his death. He had driven out the buyers and the seller from the temple because they were making the sanctuary a marketplace of noise, of greed, and dishonesty. When Christ was driving them out, all those who were in the courtyard witnessed the divine power manifested on his countenance, on his face, and they were amazed, and also they were terrified. So they obeyed his word, and they left the courtyard with the animals and the money, without resistance. When the priests and the elders who collaborated with the merchants finally returned to the temple, they found Jesus was healing the sick and the dying. And they saw children who were healed, waving palm branches, singing, Hosanna to the son of David. And the priest and the elder also heard the people rejoicing and praising God. You would think that these Jewish priests and elders were impressed, right? And they, prob they should be touched by the scene. But no, something was boiling inside their heart. Jealousy that Jesus was so popular and prejudice. Who is this Jesus? He is nobody. He came from a humble beginning. But they didn't say anything. They waited until the next day before they complained. And that was while Jesus was teaching in the temple. 
they showed up and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? You know, the priests and the elders had unmistakable evidence of Christ's power when they saw him heal the people. And when they saw heaven's authority flesh from his face, when he was chasing away the money changers and the merchants from the courtyards. But they still asked, by what authority? We know then that it was not evidence that they wanted. They asked the question because they were trying to trap Jesus in proclaiming himself as the Messiah. If Jesus were to proclaim himself to be the Messiah, they would accuse him of blasphemy. And then they would stir up the people against him. They wished to destroy his influence and they wanted to put him to death. Well, Jesus knew what was in their hearts and Jesus didn't answer the question. Instead, Jesus turned the table and asked them, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Where did John the Baptist come from? From heaven or from earth? This is in Matthew 21, 24, 25. Christ asked, where did John get his authority in baptizing people? Seems like he was off the subject, right? So what was Jesus trying to get at? We'll explain it in a few minutes. So after Jesus asked the question by what authority John was baptizing, the priest and the religious leader discussed among themselves. If we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from people, we fear the crowd, for they all consider John to be a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he, Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. The priest and the elders said, we don't know. This answer was a lie. They answered that way because the priest saw that they were at a no-win position. John the Baptist had come for the purpose of bearing witness of Christ, whose authority they were now questioning. They remember John had pointed out Jesus saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And do you remember at the baptism of Jesus, while he was praying, the heaven opens up and the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, heard saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, the priests and the elders and the rulers, they all remember that scene. They also remember how John had repeatedly told the prophecies concerning about the Messiah. But they dare not say John's baptism was from heaven. Because if they acknowledge John to be a prophet, as the people believe him to be, they couldn't deny Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God. On the other hand, they could not answer the question by saying John's baptism was from man. Because the people totally believed John was a prophet from God. So then they, what, they resort to answer, we don't know. It was under this context that Christ spoke the parable of the father and the two sons that I had just read. How does this incident relate to the parable? Well, in this parable, the father represents God. The vineyard represents the church. And the two sons represent two classes of people. This lesson has some pointers for Jesus' hearer to learn and also for us to learn. Let me discuss the second son first. In the parable, the second son answered the father, said, 
I will, sir, to help the vineyard. But at the end, he didn't do it, representing the Pharisees and the religious rulers. Why? During Jesus' time, and even years before that, the religious life of the Jewish nation was not what it seemed to be. The worship was not genuine. It was more a superficial act. You remember when the law was proclaimed on Mount Sinai by the voice of God, all the people pledged themselves to obey, and they all said what? All that the Lord has spoken we will do. But did they obey the law? They did not. They went to worship the gods of the Gentiles. And now after 1400 plus years later, things hadn't changed much. God came in the person of Christ to show them the law of God through his own life and through his teaching. Jesus didn't just talk the talk. He demonstrated God's law. But sadly, the Jews rejected him. Christ had given them abundant evidence of his authority and divine power. They were convinced in their heart. But they were not convicted. They were not converted because of their own love of power, so they harden their hearts. They rather follow their own system of belief, their own interpretation of the law, and refuse Christ and Christ's teaching. They were just like the second son who answered the father, said that he will obey, but he actually didn't. Another point. Now we talk about the first son. The first son represent the unbelievers and sinners. During the first century, many of them were repented after they heard the gospel from John the Baptist. While well, John had proclaimed to everyone, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So this group represented by the first son they didn't obey God at first, but after they heard the message, they repented afterward. So they obeyed God the Father, and they did the work. So, after giving the parable of the two sons, Christ asked them a question. Which of the two sons did his father's will? They said, the first. Well, they didn't realize that by choosing the first son, they were incriminating themselves because the first son represented the unbelievers, the sinners that I just mentioned, whom the religious leader loathed and looked down upon. So Christ was telling them that what? The unbelievers and the sinners were better than they, the Pharisees and the religious leaders whom were represented by the second son. Well, Jesus tell them, I tell you the truth, tax collectors and prostitutes will go ahead of you into the kingdom of God. The, the ignorant unbelievers and sinners realized the truth and repented and were baptized by John. Therefore, Christ said they will go ahead of the religious leader into the kingdom of God. The Jewish leaders had the truth first from the prophets of the scriptures. They also had John the Baptist, and now they also have the Son of God. Sadly, they were not convicted and they were not converted even after reading and seeing these powerful evidence. They insisted that they were right in their own way. So no wonder Jesus said the sinners will go into heaven before they do. Another point. This is an important point. 
Christ did not say to the religious leader that they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He only said the tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God before they do. Christ was trying to hint to them that they still have chance to enter God's kingdom if they will remove these obstacles that they themselves had created and holding on to. Christ continued to extend the invitation to them, and he longed to see them to get rid of their pretensions and to repent it of their ways. They were the second son, all talks, but not doers of the truth. Not long before, John the Baptist also rebuked the son of the priests and the rulers and had pointed out their sins of not really doing the work of God and that they were hypocrites. They had listened to John's preaching and many turned their unrighteousness. So why they don't believe in Jesus? The author said their conversion was not genuine. Let me read what she said. Had the profession of the Jewish leaders been genuine, they would have received John's testimony and accepted Jesus as the Messiah. But they did not show the fruits of repentance and righteousness. The very ones whom they despised were pressing into the kingdom of God before them. Another point. You know, there are tests in our lives to see whether a love for God is genuine or sincere. In the parable, the son who said, I go, sir, as he was faithful and obedient, but time proved that his declaration was not real. He had no true love for his father. The Pharisees prided themselves on their holiness, but when tested, it was found wanting. They had no real love for God. They only obey when it was of their interest. And when it was not, they reasoned away their obligation. Christ told his disciple and the multitude, but do not do what they do, referring to the Jewish religious leader, for they do not practice what they teach. Next point. Self-righteousness is not true righteousness. The Jewish religious leader trusted that they were good enough because they performed all that was required of them according to the tradition. They thought they were better than everyone, the sinner, the poor, and the Gentile. But Christ said they were not. In fact, they were disobedient to God's commands. How so? They were supposed to be a holy nation. Holy priesthood for other nations. They were supposed to witness for other nations, but they didn't do it. The author trying to relate their example to us also. She said, even today, we have people that act like the second son in the parable. God's command in Matthew 28 is the command for his followers to unite with him to save souls of the world. But sadly, many said they would do it, but... In reality, they didn't. They also said it is because they haven't truly received Christ's love. Or perhaps they are ignorant of what God's love is and therefore they haven't abided in his love. And so they are empty inside and have nothing to give. And therefore they resort to pretense, just like the Pharisees. Self-love is the barrier. It is difficult for many to deny themselves and pick up the cross and follow Jesus. To do that, they are afraid would sacrifice too much of themselves, perhaps their time or their resources. They also said the conviction they once had, if they continue to do that, will slowly wear away by this self-centeredness. And eventually, obeying God's commands would become habitual. The ear may hear God's word, but the spiritual perceptive powers has left them. 
And so they are not impressed with what they hear. I'm going to call a sobering thought from the author. She said, do not think that because you do not manifest decided hostility to Christ, you are doing him service. We thus deceive our own souls by withholding that which God has given us to use in his service, be it time or means or any other of his entrusted gifts, we work against him. Satan uses the listless, sleepy indolence of professed Christians to strengthen his forces and win souls to his side. That is serious. I sense part of me is like what has been described here by the author. But oftentimes human beings are helpless. We are weak, we are incapable, we are timid, and we are selfish. Just like what Paul has described. There's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. However, when we realize our diseased condition, our sickly condition, and seeks healing from the Greek physician who has said, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. As we come to Christ and seek his healing of our sin sickness, the Lord can use us as his worker in his vineyard as described in the parable. Another point, although the first son was not condemned by Christ, but he was not complimented by Christ either. The class that represented by the first son deserves no merit if they hold on to the initial position. Although this class of people are honest and not pretentious like the Pharisees, but they are not virtuous and they are not righteous. What they make them worthy of mention is that they were sanctified by the truth and they were converted. They changed and they became bold witnesses for Christ. When the appeals of the Holy Spirit invited them to go work today in my vineyard, they responded without delay. Paul advice all of us is that today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. It is not safe to delay obedience. You may never hear the invitation again. Time is short. Let us don't delay our response to the invitation of the Holy Spirit. If we stay in idleness, conviction may wear away and eventually our mind will be molded by the world in such a way that it will be difficult for us to distinguish between right and wrong. And this is what the author said. Another point. The command, go work today in my vineyard, is the test of sincerity of our faith. Will we be doers and not just sayers? Will we be able to accept the call that will put all our God-given knowledge into work? Will we work faithfully, undistracted for the owner of the vineyard? The Apostle Peter instructed us how to equip ourselves to work for God and avoid being corrupted by the world. Let me read Roman, I mean Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 to 8. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world 
caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self control, and to self control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Great instruction and assurance by the Apostle Peter. Another point. In the parable, the church is the vineyard. The two sons were requested to work in the vineyard. The author said Christ is not teaching us to restrict our love, our compassion, and our work only for our church members. Do you remember the Great Commission in Matthew 28? The Lord's vineyard is to be enlarged to the ends of the world. One final point. We need to look at the life of Christ, how he served his father. He is an example of what every son and daughter should be. And this is the kind of obedience Christ wants us to have today. He served his father out of free will, out of his love for him. Psalms 48. I delight to do thy will, O my God, he declared. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Even when he was only 12, he told his parents, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And again he said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So in summary, there are two classes of people in this world today. Those who disobey God and those who obey God. All who are sons and daughters of God are called to work with God and Christ and the heavenly angels. Why does God want each one of us to be his worker? Do we need to earn his salvation? Do we need to buy his love? No, we don't need to buy God's love or to earn salvation. God's love and salvation are free for anyone who wants to receive them. According to the author, the purpose God wants us to work with him is to give us opportunity to develop, to develop our character. Furthermore, doing or not doing good work will reveal to ourselves whether we have or have not the love of God in our hearts. When we love God, these kind of love for others will naturally flow from within us. And to love Him is to be happy in obeying His commands and in serving Him. John 15, 10 said, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So the whole thing, again, is about love. When we truly know God, is to love him. And we love him, serving him, obeying him, it shouldn't be a problem. Happy Sabbath.